I'm uh, very honored and thrilled to be back here at uh, Cornerstone Church. I was here last year with my wife, Debbie. Uh, this year, I sort of decided to bring the family. And so Debbie's mom is here, Mitzi Sestero. Say hello. <laughs> And we also have other relatives and and friends. I think if I remember last time I spoke here just on the eve of the election, and uh, things have been rather interesting ever since. (laughs) I must admit that for me the shock and the elation and to be honest the sheer relief of the outcome has uh, not left me yet. And the shock and dismay and apoplexy of that day has not left the other side either. (laughs) I'm sort of reminded of the opening scene in, in Paradise Lost in which the rebel angels mount this massive campaign against God. And then in Milton's words... They are flung headlong flaming from the ethereal sky down to bottomless perdition. And they all land in the pandemonium of hell where they for a moment are confounded and dazed. But then they slowly begin to mount a mutiny and a revolt. And I think that's actually a pretty good summary of the Democratic Party right about now. (laughs) Well... Trump. What can we say? He's the most, he's the most implausible, unusual, unexpected, infuriating, untrained, out there guy to ever occupy the Oval Office. (laughs) Thing about him is, I think about flashes my mind back to Reagan. I'm, I'm a young Reaganite from the 80s. And, uh, and Reagan was a man of priorities. Reagan's view was that you can't change the world in 40 different ways. You can change it in maybe two or three ways. And so Reagan would focus on the Soviet Union and taxes and inflation. And that was pretty much it. Everything else he sort of let go in order to try to achieve these key priorities. Now, Trump could not be more different. I mean, this is a guy who's fighting on every front. He's trying to change legislation and repeal Obamacare and get us out of the Pacific Trade Treaty. And he's taking on people even in his own party. And even while he's fighting the political battle, he's fighting the cultural battle. Here he has time to swat Meryl Streep and take on Saturday Night Live. So this guy is at it. And you can step back and say it's all theater. But then I think we have to remember as Christians that by the mere fact of his election and the immediate aftermath of it, this guy saved us the Supreme Court. That's a fact. Now, my goal is actually not to speak about Trump or speak about the overall political climate, I do want to talk about one of the core issues of American politics, but also morality, uh, an issue that relates to the court, and that is um, an issue that relates to the Constitution, uh, and that is the issue of the protection and sanctity of life, the pro-life issue. So we begin with a couple of of paradoxes. Uh, One of the paradoxes, of course, is that Trump himself, who has very little of a history 
of pro-life advocacy or activism nevertheless has become in a few short months, I think, the most pro-life president of our lifetime. Unbelievable. It really shows you that God uses unexpected envoys, strange uh, messengers. And let's look at the paradox on the other side of the aisle because we have a party in American politics, the Democratic Party, whose official moral commitment is to the idea of compassion. Compassion. It's the party of compassion. It's the party of moist eyes and tears shed for the outsider. And the irony of it all is that the very party that claims to champion the outsider, and by the outsider here I mean the neglected, the ignored, uh, the illegal immigrant, the snail darter. <laughs> Nevertheless, the orbit of compassion does not seem to stretch wide enough to include the unborn. Why not? Why not? Well, you might say, well, maybe it's because we're not really sure, as the Supreme Court said in Roe versus Wade, we're not really sure when life begins. But if you think about it, that's really no argument at all, because if you're not really sure about something, it's generally wise to err on the side of safety. You're a hunter who's going out into the woods. You see a kind of rustling behind the bushes. It could be a deer. But it could also be your neighbor, Bob. <laughs> you don't exactly want to open fire. You decide that if you don't know, let's take a risk on behalf of saving a life. And yet, in this particular case, in this particular case, this commonsensical premise gets sort of thrown out the window. And then the Democrats assure us, the left assures us, that the right to abortion is in fact in the U.S. Constitution. They have real trouble finding other rights in there, like the right to own a gun, but they say that the, the abortion right, you know, it's, it's right in there. It's right in there. Now, I don't, I'm not one of those guys who carries a pocket Constitution, but I have read it, and you can read it. And you can read it all kinds of different ways. Hold it up to the light. Read it upside down. Squeeze lemon juice on it. No, the abortion right does not, in fact, appear in the Constitution. It's not there. But let's say it was there. Let's say it happened to be there right alongside all the other rights. One of the remarkable things about today's left is they don't just support the right to abortion, they support the right for the government to pay for it. They want the government to fund it. Now, if you think about this, this places the so-called abortion right above every other right. Because we have many fundamental rights specifically outlined in the Constitution and none of them are funded to a single penny. We have a First Amendment right to free speech. Is the government going to buy us a newspaper? No. We have to exercise our free speech at our own expense. We have a First Amendment right to the free exercise of religion. Is the government going to build our churches? No. We have to build them ourselves. You have the Second Amendment right to own a gun. You have the right to assemble, and so on, and so on, and so on. And all these rights are exercised by us with our own resources. But this one right, the abortion right above all others, is supposed to be a right that demands that if you can't exercise it, the government should extract money from other people, including people who find abortion abhorrent, and make them pay for something 
that contradicts their basic values. The point I'm trying to make is that we're dealing ultimately with a sick mentality in the church of modern progressivism. Abortion has become a sacrament. It's very, very sad. Now, this notion of abortion is never defended on its own merit. Nobody actually defends abortion. I think what's insidious about abortion, it is defended under the guise of freedom. Freedom. Pro-choice. Pro-choice. And for a while I thought to myself, where has the Democratic Party gotten this idea of choice as a ruse for defending something that would really otherwise seem to be indefensible. I mean, if abortion isn't wrong, what can be right? The, the deep tragedy of abortion isn't just that a mother kills her child, it's that a mother kills her own child. And so how can this actually be something that gets people politically excited, politically motivated? What on earth is going on here? In doing some of their research for Hillary's America, I went back to the debates that occurred in the 19th century between then Senate candidate Abraham Lincoln and his opponent, the Democrat Stephen Douglas. This was for the Illinois Senate. Turned out that just a few years later, those same two men would contest the presidency of, of the United States. But here they were debating for the Senate, and they were debating not abortion, but they were debating slavery. But if you follow those debates, they have a, a weirdly contemporary ring, because you realize that not merely in substance, but also in form, they are virtually identical to what we would call the pro-life, pro-choice debate now. So Douglas, who's the Democrat, basically says, I am not for slavery. He goes, I am neither for it, nor am I against it. He goes, we have a big country. We have to learn, we have to agree to disagree. And since we have a big country, and since different people have different views of this matter, every state, every territory, every community should decide for itself if it wants to have slaves. In other words, each community should vote slavery up or down depending on its own preferences. If you think about it, this is a pro-choice view. It's a pro-choice view not on the individual, but for the community. Each community decides and votes up or down on slavery. And on the surface, this appears to be actually a very pragmatic, democratic way to solve a problem. But I think Abraham Lincoln puts his finger right on the central flaw of this whole approach when he basically raises this question. He says, look, obviously we are for a right to choose, but the right to choose can never be indifferent to the content of the choice. In other words, the right to choose must examine what is actually being chosen. And here you want a community, a state, a territory to choose to do what? To actually deprive other guys of their choice. And Lincoln says that is actually an abuse of the idea of choice. Your choice is actually being used to cancel out the choice of others. You, you are using your freedom to deny other people freedom. And so the real flaw of the so-called pro-choice movement today is you're choosing to actually 
cancel out the entire life choices of other people who are in the process of being born. Being born. So, so these are the ways in which history, far from being buried, is in some ways very much, very much with us. The reason I made the movie Hillary's America was because the Democrats, the left, had been faulting us, conservatives, Christians, and attacking us for a whole generation by playing the so-called race card. Race card. The Republicans, the right, the conservatives, the Christians, that's the party of bigotry. And yet, I tried to show in the movie, wait a minute, it's the Democratic Party that was the party for 50 years that not only defended and protected slavery, but developed the notion that slavery is a positive good, an actual moral argument for slavery. This had never existed really anywhere in the world before the 19th century Democratic Party came up with it. And then the Democrats founded the Ku Klux Klan and then revived it when the Republicans shut it down. And this is the party that fought against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So my point isn't just to dredge up dirt, it's to say, wait a minute. First of all, you guys have never admitted this history. You've never acknowledged it. You've never apologized for it. You've never paid one penny of restitution for it. And that's bad enough. Now you're taking the crimes that you did and trying to foist them on the party and on the groups that have been fighting you at this bad stuff for over a century. That's, that's a pretty big lie. That's a pretty big lie. Now, very interestingly, since, since the movie came out, and really since the election, maybe even a little before the election, we have noticed in American politics a, a switch, a pivot. Uh, the race card is, well, I still see it occasionally, but in social media now it's kind of lost its sting. Because these days of the left says, oh, look, you know, uh, David Duke has been trying to make his way into the Republican Party. Tons of people on social media will put up little memes of Senator Robert Byrd, conscience of the Senate, mentor to Hillary and Obama, you know, wearing his good old dusty Ku Klux Klan outfit. <laughs> so the race card just doesn't have the same pungency that it used to. And so we have seen the emergence of a new card, a new card. And that card, of course, is the fascism card, the fascism card. And the fascism card is based on the simple idea that fascism is a phenomenon of the right. Maybe communism is a phenomenon of the left, but fascism definitely belongs on the right. Trump is a fascist. I uh, read a scholar of fascism, no less, so this is Robert Paxton at Columbia University, saying one of the very alarming phenomena about Trump is that when he crosses both hands and looks to the left, he kind of looks like Mussolini. Very, very damning indeed. Now, this notion that Trump is a fascist, the conservatives are the, the neo-Nazi party, is, it's not merely a rhetorical accusation. In fact, thinking back, some similar things were said about Reagan, about Bush. The volume of them is much greater now. But right now, they also serve a very important political purpose. The charge of fascism is being used to legitimize all kinds of behavior that would otherwise be completely unacceptable in a democratic society. <clears throat> Imagine if we had done this to Obama. Demand that electors 
not cast the votes for the candidate that they're pledged to, boycott the inauguration, disrupt the inauguration, turn over cars, set fire to things, block people, try to drive rival points of view off the campus, dress up in masks with weapons, and outlaw dissenting points of view from being heard. The ironic thing is that this kind of fascist behavior, it's very reminiscent of Mussolini's black shirts and Hitler's brown shirts. This kind of fascist behavior, oddly enough, is carrying the banner of anti-fascism. Anti-fascism. And so this is actually something I wanted to look into in a searching way. Because one of the remarkable things about fascism is that the, the content of it, what it actually means, has virtually disappeared, not only from public consciousness, but from our textbooks. Think of it this way. If I were to ask you, who is the great philosopher of Marxism? You know, Karl Marx. Who's the great philosopher of capitalism? Adam Smith. Who's the great philosopher of fascism? It's hard to say. We don't know. No one knows. Why not? Is that because there weren't any? There wasn't someone who thought of these ideas and put them forward? No. It's because that someone has actually been moved under the rug, has been removed from public consciousness. Fascism now is simply described in very vague terms. Like fascists are demagogues, fascists are nationalists. Trump wants to make America great again. Didn't Hitler want to make Germany great again? But this is, you may say, the fourth grade take on fascism. If fascism were nationalism, then Gandhi would be a fascist. Because Gandhi was a nationalist. Che Guevara was a nationalist. Fidel Castro was a nationalist. Mandela. Virtually all the anti-colonial leaders were nationalists. Stalin was a nationalist. He talked about Mother Russia. So nationalism is an only an incidental feature of fascism. I want to talk about one feature of fascism that relates to the issue that we've been talking about this evening, the pro-life issue. And this is the influence on the Nazis by American progressives. Now who are the progressives? The progressives were a group on the left that emerged in the early part of the 20th century, about a hundred years ago. And their ideological commitment was to something called social Darwinism. Social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is simply, simply the idea that nature is a struggle for survival, and that includes human nature, and that just as in nature, the weak, the, the, in, the ones that can't defend themselves, the disposable creatures get preyed upon, die of starvation or hunger, get, you may say, wiped out by the course of nature, so too there are humans who are worthless, disposable, unfit, and it's our job to figure out a way to get rid of these people. If they are here, we have to figure out a way to kill them. But if they're not here, it's even better if you can prevent them from being born in the first place. Now, this sounds like an atrocious, outrageous Nazi scheme, but actually the Nazis never came up with it. The scheme was actually developed in the United States. Now, the inventor of eugenics, eugenics simply, the word simply means better born, but the idea of eugenics is to promote the survival of the fit 
and to promote the elimination or extermination of the unfit. This idea was developed by progressives in the United States long before it was taken up later by the Nazis. Many of you know the name Margaret Sanger, and Margaret Sanger is the founder of Planned Parenthood. Margaret Sanger was a relatively low-level member of this eugenic fraternity. She was actually not a leader in the eugenics movement. She was, you may say, a eugenics wannabe. But there was a whole host of these eugenics organizations, the Eugenics Breeders Office, the American Breeder Association, the Na National Council for Race Betterment, and these were all over the country, and they came up with all kinds of ideas. One of the ideas that Sanger strongly supported, this was, by the way, long before abortion, was forced sterilization. Forced sterilization. Now, Margaret Sanger knew that forced sterilization is something that sounds bad, and that people are going to be reluctant to go for it, so she came up with an idea for how to sort of pressure people to agree to be sterilized, and that was to take these people, these disposable people, of either low intelligence or poor, unwanted, orphans, the disabled, and she said, let's start by segregating, segregating these people on farms, where their life will be so miserable that after a while they'll, they'll want, they're going to want to join normal society and will agree will make them voluntarily agree to sterilize themselves before they do that. This is Margaret Sanger in a series of speeches and papers now carefully sanitized from our textbooks. And then there was another eugenicist named Paul Papineau of California and he goes, sterilization is actually good but there are people who are going to still come through the net so to speak and these are people we just don't want in our society we have to figure out a way to get rid of them. So he came up with the idea of euthanasia. Euthanasia. And he said in order to have euthanasia on a fairly efficient scale, we need to have what he called lethal chambers. Lethal chambers to carry out this euthanasia. Now you have to remember that these American eugenic organizations were part of an international fraternity of progressives. Progressives from Germany, from England and the United States, the three leading countries in eugenics. The Americans were number one, the Germans were number two, and the British were number three. And the German eugenicists got a hold of this, and so when the Nazis came to power in 1933, the first thing that they did, one of the very first laws that they passed was forced sterilization for the unwanted, the disposable, and what they called imbeciles. Imbeciles. Shortly thereafter, they established lethal chambers. And after a little bit of research, they decided to use carbon monoxide gas to gas these imbeciles, these old people, these sick people, these unwanted people. It has to be remembered that all of this was being done long before the Holocaust, long before Auschwitz, long before the so-called final solution is applied to the Jews. The first gas chambers were used for eugenic purposes. And the idea for them, I'm suggesting, came straight from the American progressives. Who says so? Hitler says so. Hitler says so. Now, later, the eugenics program, the euthanasia program, was expanded and targeted against the Jews and became the notorious and infamous final solution. And many of the administrators of the so-called final solution were the very medical personnel who had been carrying out the euthanasia program. Now, you might wonder what American progressives in the 1930s thought once they recognized that their ideas were being directly taken up by the Nazis. The answer is, they knew about it 
And they were extremely excited. They were extremely excited. Uh, I report in my book a scene where Madison Grant, the head of the New York Zoological Society, shows up at a fellow progressive's house and he's got a congratulatory letter from Hitler. And he says, it's fantastic, check this out, I just got a letter from Hitler. And the other guy goes, you won't believe this, he goes into his parlor and produces his own letter from Hitler. And the point of all this is that these guys are congratulating themselves on the impact that their progressive eugenical policies of sterilization are having on the new Nazi regime in Germany. A California eugenicist goes to visit his colleague and he tells him, you can feel very proud of what you have accomplished in your life because your eugenic organization has provided the exact blueprint that the Nazi regime in Germany has now taken up to, to carry out the most progressive eugenical policies in the world. Now, all of this is, has a bit of a strange sound to it. Why? Because after World War II, after World War II, Nazism became irredeemably tainted with the idea of Holocaust. Once the concentration camps were liberated, once the starving, emaciated figures came tottering, ghost-like out of those places, Nazism essentially became morally discredited completely, as did fascism. And the progressives in America, who were just coming to power in the universities, in the media, in Hollywood, establishing a dominant position, which has only become more dominant since then, these progressives looked around and said to themselves, this history of progressive complicity, of progressives being, you may say, in bed with fascism and Nazism, a story that I've only touched upon here tonight, this history is so incriminating that if the American people found out about it, progressivism as a political movement is finished. The Democratic Party, which has been the vehicle for progressivism, FDR, JFK, this movement will not be able to recover if this history, if these facts become known. And so, it is our job to sort of clean them up, sanitize the record. And part of what we have to do is to take fascism and Nazism, which were always understood, not only by their own champions, but even by their critics, to be on the left. Think about this. When Hitler took over the Nazi party, it was called the German Workers' Party. He changed the name. He said, from now on, it will be called the National Socialist German Workers' Party. In other words, Hitler wanted to make it really clear that the thing that Nazism stood for more than anything else was socialism. And so the progressives in America in the 50s figured out, we have to sort of get the socialism out of National Socialism. We have to move fascism and Nazism into the right-wing column. This is the biggest of big lies. And it allows today people to perpetrate a fascist ideology, to use fascist tactics, but to pretend to be fighting fascism. Fighting fascism. The, the phrase, the big lie, was used by Hitler himself. Uh, Hitler said that small lies are actually kind of easy to catch. Because if, someone, if you tell someone a small lie, they can compare it to their own experience and verify if what you're saying is true. But a big lie, according to Hitler, is easier to sell. Because it's so big, it's kind of hard to get your head around it. And moreover, in America, 
Big lies are very easy to sell if you belong to a political movement that dominates media, Hollywood, the world of comedy and entertainment, and academia. These are the biggest megaphones of our culture. And so you can promulgate big lies because they just reverberate from one of your megaphones to another. Even if you in the third row knew that this was all false, you'd never be able to contradict it because you don't have a big, um, big enough megaphone to be able to shout into the noise out there. Now, the good news is that we in America do actually have a megaphone. One that is in general not so well used. It's, we have a private megaphone because of technology. If you have a little Facebook, you can say, oh, I only have 500 members. I only have 50 friends on Facebook. Yeah, but they've got 50 friends apiece on Facebook. You're a little publisher, whether you know it or not. You can get information out there. And the more catchy it is, the further it's going to get out there. Our other big megaphone is the one that we're using right now, the church. The church is a megaphone, and a big one. And I really commend you here at Cornerstone because your pastor and your team are using this megaphone. So many of our pastors... So many of our pastors, like so many of our Republican congressmen, are invertebrates. <laughs> and, and they're invertebrates not just out of personal cowardice, but also because they fear the great intimidate, intimidation power of the media. The media has the power to destroy. You notice what's happened in America today. Essentially, the media has pushed aside the Democratic Party to become the main source of opposition to Trump. It's almost as though the media says, hey, Democrats, you're fools. You don't know how to fight Trump. You step aside, we'll take over. And what we have is a, and now we have a big fight. And I want to close, well, come to my conclusion by, by noting this. It's true that we may have won a big political victory last November. And it's true that with all three branches of government, for all the clumsiness and ineptitude, there's going to be a chance to make some real gains. But let's also remember that we have kind of lost the culture war, by which I mean we have surrendered these powerful institutions of education, of entertainment, of movies, of media, to the other side. And while our political victory is, is temporary, their possession of these megaphones is permanent. And so it's a big, it's a big fight. Now, the, the Bible calls us, I believe, to be in this fight. In this fight. Many people don't know it, but our history as Christians, as conservatives, and some people may say, well, what's this, Christian, conservative? Are you, are you implying it's the same thing? Well, the Bible calls us to be salt of the earth. And what is salt but a preservative? And what is preservation if not conservation? And what is the function of the conservative, if not to conserve? And so I'm not implying a easy identity between, between faith and politics. But I am saying that the one leads to the other, where we're in a big political debate. But as the abortion issue shows, under the political debate is a moral debate. And under the moral debate, I think, is a spiritual fight. And there's spiritual warfare 
underlying our political warfare. I would never have guessed this when I left India at the age of 17 to come to America as a young, bewildered exchange student with $500 in my pocket. But somehow, I think, through the hand of God, I've been flung into this crazy political environment um, with a kind of bizarre talent for exposing big lies. Big lies. If you follow me on social media, if you're involved in social media, that's one way to use your influence. Most of us use very little of our actual influence. But, but if we use our influence together, we're actually a very formidable force. We're a formidable force. Uh, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we happen to live at a time in which a lot of very precious things hang in the balance. The Christianity that we could one takes, once take for granted in our culture is not only now controversial, but there are systematic efforts to drive it out of public view, to force us, in a sense, into the catacombs. The America that has meant so much to so many of us, that has given us the kind of life unavailable in the rest of the world. This America is now under ferocious, moral, political, and sometimes even physical attack, not just from outside, but also from within. And so we have this double fight on our hands. If you want to support me, order my book, The Big Lie, because it will equip you. It will equip you to diagnose things that lie below the surface. It's very easy to catch retail lies. Oh, the Benghazi business was due to a video. Small lie. If you want to keep your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Small lie. These are retail lies, but behind them are the meta lies. The big lies, the lies that turn history upside down, the, the lies that take the good guys and the bad guys and make them exchange places. Ultimately, truth is a very powerful weapon, even now in an age of disinformation. I think it was Winston Churchill who said that when confronted by a fact, you can ignore it, you can avert your gaze, you can deride it, you can scorn it, but at the end of the day, there it is. God is ultimately a God of truth, and we can be his ambassadors by being ambassadors of truth in the world. And if we do that, we are more than a match for our opponents, because at the end of the day, the truth is what will set us free. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.